so you know i did not knit this and it'll take a while because of those um brm uh functions take a while i think it's pretty self-explanatory for easy questions um i just copy and paste it like last time so we can see what the question is in the model definition below which line is the likelihood and the y sub i line is the likelihood and as we go along if please feel free to jump in if you feel like i did something wrong or if you did something differently definitely want to have a discussion not just me talking at everyone question two in the model definition just above how many parameters and posterior distribution mu and sigma um so using the model definition above write down the appropriate form of base theorem that includes the proper likelihood and priors somehow we got lucky with latex <laughs> i got this thing to work um nice. well, you have a comment ken um nice no nice you uh, like my latex yes no i didn't, I didn't want to tackle that one i've actually gotten it's not a very useful skill, but I'm pretty good at latex. <laughs> yeah, for, um, the, for the math, it seems like it is a useful skill. Yeah, I guess for the math. Um, but yes, so basically you can go and find this formula in the book um, and then just kind of plugging in the model that we had and the parameter, the bounds of those distributions or parameters of the distributions. Okay, E4 in the model definition below, which line is the linear model? And that would be the second line, U sub I. So the model in E4, how many parameters are in the posterior? And then we have three alpha, beta, sigma. And I think somewhere in the book, um, McElroy talks about mu being a, I uh, have oh. it as a posterior dis distribution, but yes, it's not it's not a model parameter in the same it, way. It, that's right. Yes, it's not a model parameter per se. But it has like a limbo existence. Yeah, uh, it's kind of a it's a function right of the other parameters, the alpha beta, and then obviously y sub i being a function of the sigma as well. Yeah. So okay, um, let's see where were we? Medium one. So for the model definition below, simulate observed y values from the prior, not the posterior. So I think I this is where I decided I started out just using the normal stuff in the book. Um, and then I thought, you know, this is a good chance for me to do it the tidyverse way. So I've been trying to approach it more from the tidyverse way since I use the tidyverse in uh, other aspects of my my work and analysis. So here's what I did. This is very similar if you look at the tidyverse guide that um, Solomon Kurtz, I think, put together. Uh, you just generating using our norm, creating a tibble here, and then prior is generated from sample mu, sample sigma. And then this wasn't required, but I noticed there's a lot of plotting that goes on in the tidyverse guide. So I plotted, what did I plot here? Uh, the prior Y, yeah. Can you, can you make your um, console panel smaller? Yeah, so let me can see more. Let me your... make this bigger. Um, I think. Yeah, there we great. go. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's a good call, call out. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so translate the model above, and I just use the BRM, S function BRM. <laughs> Um, How does that compare with um, his Q app? Uh, it's basically a more tight, tidy, tidyverse friendly way, I guess. I don't. I, I'm not sure exactly. I think somebody, probably someone on this call, could comment. Um, to be honest, I did not have as much time as I'd hoped to really dig into the details and look at the documentation. So, opening up the floor to anybody who wants to has done a lot of reading on that. 
I've done no reading, but I might venture a guess that. Yeah, you know, go, jump in. BRMS might be more open. Uh, there's like levels of open source, but like if his was written specifically for this book versus something that is. I, I think know, it, it's doing it, also doing an actual Monte Carlo simulation, probably using Stan under the hood as opposed to QAP, which is doing a quadratic approximation. This is why the BRM takes longer to run. Yeah, that's right, because it does use Monte yeah. Carlo under the hood, that's right. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, so I just, um, I was thinking I was gonna knit this, so I had the pal equals false there, but imagining we have some kind of data that's, you know, our actual data, then just stating our priors here, this would be, based on what I could tell, and you could put this anywhere, you could put this in a file slash my test or just in your regular working direct directory. Um, so yeah, and this is what I use going forward and it worked, it, I mean, it looked like it worked to me. So <laughs> when we, we use it on real, when I use it on real data, so. Okay, so now we're kind of doing the reverse. Um, yeah, I didn't knit this, so, okay. Um, the model below into a mathematical model definition. So basically you can, kind of, this is this symbol for distributed normal uniform and then exponential. Okay, so a sample of students is measured for height each year for three years. So this one I had thought a lot about, and I think there's probably different ways to approach this. So I'm curious if anybody else has any thoughts about it. After the third year, you want to fit a linear regression predicting height using year as a predictor. Write down the mathematical model definition for this regression using any variable names and priors you choose. Be prepared to defend your choice of priors. Okay, so first of all, Anybody who's in social sciences would be thinking panel data, right? Um, and I think Justin, you are in social sciences, so maybe you were, if you looked at this one, you were thinking that too, <laughs> um, which kind of threw me for a bit because we have like two indexes we're thinking about, time, right? And then the individual. So I'll talk about my priors first. Um, I chose 170 as opposed to 178. And the reason I did that um, is because I looked up what is the average eight height of a teenager, and it was five foot seven inches, which is about 170 centimeters. Um, I just kept the distribution, or I'm sorry, the, the um, standard deviation as 20. And then I, I guess I picked two for, the, for a um, log normal, again, because we would imagine that, that would be a positive, we wouldn't restrict it to positive values, right? So I picked two because the, the highest density, I did a little bit of, I guess, experimentation here, seemed to make sense in terms of how much I would expect a teenager to grow in a year. Again, it's been a while since I was a teen, and I know there's a lot of um, variation. And then I just kept the uniform prior, or I'm sorry, I guess I had normal. I, kept, I don't know why I did normal. Maybe I thought that... Um, it didn't seem reasonable to have a uniform there. So, so here, the kind of what, what gave me a lot of um, pause, I guess, is thinking about this um, because they want year, first I had a year as a predictor variable, but then I thought, I was looking at some panel data stuff and you really don't have year in those equations. So I was thinking, we're really, what you would imagine is that for an, on average for a student, their function is a high, is their current height at a, at a, at a, pre, a current time is a function of their previous, some you know, positive value multi, D multiplied by their previous, their height at a previous time for that given student. So that's where the mu I, I sub T minus one comes in. Um, and I'll pause there and see if anyone else has any ideas of how they approach to this. 
Well, this is a lot more sophisticated than what I did. Um, okay, well, you might be, maybe, I might have been overthinking it, you know. Well, I don't, I don't have the experience with panel data either, but I just did a linear regression of, um, you know, the A plus B times the year. Okay, pretty that was something I was definitely debating about. I was trying to figure out, how, given that we have kind of panel data, how to think about that. But yeah, that might, that might be the correct and answer. I think your model is estimating mu for each student individually. Is that right? It would be, which, because when we don't think about T, right, it's mu sub I. Right. Um, so that's why I added the sub, subscript T, uh, not saying it was the right choice, but after yeah. some... I was just doing consideration. Um, that's what I came up with. I just did the overall mean. I mean, the, the question is pretty vague. The other th thing is it doesn't say any, give any idea how old these students are. These could be preschool students. So, oh, for some reason, I don't know why I thought it was, why did I think it was high school? I don't know why I thought it was high school because some, I must have just latched onto that. And then yeah, I was like, what's the average height for a teenager thinking that this is, you know, 16 year olds or something yeah well, that was my first assumption too and then i thought well it doesn't say anything about where these students are drawn from yeah and they could be an entire school system i suppose in which case not you you would want age in there as well and you know this could be k through k through 12 <laughs> students or something we really don't know so yeah and that would be a really um weird model to, i mean that would be there's so much difference between like a 17 year old and a four year old, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> like the terms yeah. of how they grow and the rate, it, I guess a kid who's 17 and nine months is practically an adult, right. Versus like a four year old. I don't know. That's, and they're, yeah, I know one I know, of the hard problems stretch, but... and the hard problems they have the under 18, I think you'll be going over that one, but um, yeah. it's, it's uh, I don't know. Anyway, that was what, what I was thinking, but yeah, it's really um, kind of a vague question. So the medium five is the student got taller every year. So we we have to constrain B basically to be pos uh, zero to positive. Well, actually positive. This information leads to your change of priors. How the B prior, I already have that B log normal. Um, so lower bound is zero, basically it has to be by definition. Oh, I don't know. Apparently, I started to finish that that sentence and did not <laughs> did not do it. Okay, so then I may have been underthinking this one. I suppose I tell you that the variance among heights for students of the same age is never more than sixty four centimeters. Does this lead you to revise your priors? The sigma prior, I just thought random uniform distribution with a max of eight square root of sixty four. Uh, I know a lot of times we're dealing with uniform. He gives a uniform uh, distribution for sigma. Any other thoughts about this one? Um, well, that was interesting. I did not interpret variance as a statistical term. I oh, okay. The variation and, and thought, well, okay, so 64 centimeters, that's maybe we'll call that two sigma in each direction. So four sigma overall. And I, so I thought I still made my sigma be. I made, I guess, it uniform zero to seven because um, six. Well, I was I was working in inches because again okay. that, wasn't, that wasn't specified either. In this, in this I think problem. it was was Except it centimeters? Once, you, do, I once think. you get to M six, it's centimeters. But anyway, I thought um, sigma of, of one quarter of sixty four was a, was appropriate. So I meant unif basically uniform zero to six to six or sixteen rather. Okay. Any other thoughts about this? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I mean, just real quickly, I, uh, I almost wondered, so but by the way, I did have a very similar thought about the, the panel data. I almost wondered if it was a mistake in writing the question or something like, uh, because <clears throat> maybe from the first chapter, people remember that one of the big themes of the book is going to be nested data and like having multi-level models. Mm -hmm. So he obviously is hyper aware of that, but he definitely hasn't like shown us even the notation, yeah. like double subscripting for that yet. So I was like, that's yeah. an interesting choice to have like, obviously. Yeah, it makes me wonder if I was overthinking it then. Cause like, that's how I would be, you know, I'm looking at panel data, you know, and I'm like, well, yeah, the double subscripting, you know, and 
I don't yeah. know. Um, so, so that was kind of a, so I just, I just don't know what to make of that. That's kind of like reverse engineering a question type thing more than a Bayesian type thing. But one, one question I did have <clears throat> just in general is like, so in the book, you know, if we know, for example, that Sigma um, variance has to be uh, non-negative, right? We always, we all sign in like a non-negative prior to it. And he has us do that in this case for the uh, the betas as well, um, because growth is at least non-negative, um, <clears throat> at least at that age. And so one of the things I was wondering about though, is like, even if we, we know that, do we have to encode that in the prior in that way? Because I was thinking about like, <clears throat> you know, there are normal distributions where if you have the standard deviation tight enough, in the mean high enough. That's like, fair. Like you, although, you know, in theory, um, because the, the the range, the support of the normal distribution is from negative infinity to positive infinity, like for all practical purposes, it's like strictly positive. Yeah. And, and even when that's not the case, uh, even when you have like, for example, say that you know that growth is, uh, you know, again, non-negative. Like, I still don't understand why you wouldn't put a mean zero, like normally distributed with mean of zero prior on it. And then just be like, well, the model's gonna figure it out. Yeah, but, that's a good point. Yeah. Are you and, trying to read too much information into your priors? I mean, I know a good model can figure it out anyways, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that. It's a good question. Yeah, uh, and, and, uh, and I don't have any thoughts on it. It just seems like, uh, it's, I guess my thought was that like, for, especially for example, with Sigma, we're using these uniform distributions quite a bit, uniform or exponential, but like, what if we really thought like we wanted a, a, a uni, sorry, a normal distribution where some non-negligible slice of the prior is below zero, even though we know that's impossible, we still want like the positive part to have that kind of bell curve. Uh, and I just, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to, where to take that thought. But anyway, so, so I'll leave it there. Those were all my, my thoughts about the last problems and the last medium problems. Great. Well, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Kent. All right. Um, let's see. There we go. Can you see that? Probably should make it a little bit bigger. So far, I cannot see anything other no. than your flowing. Oh, blocks. I always forget to. I have to click this share button. There's two. You have to not just click the window, but you have to click the share button. How about that? Yeah. Great. Um, so let's see. For the hard problems, the first one is just predicting height for um, what, five different individuals with the given weights. So first you've got to basically redo the model. Um, so this is just taking code from, from the book to create the model for, for modeling height as a um, linear function of weight, um, taking the weight mine, actually modeling height as a function of the weight difference from the average weight. Um, then, I wrote myself a note because I got a little confused you can, between extract samples and link and sim. So extract samples is just to get samples of the parameters from the posterior. Link gives you, basically gives you the mu value for each sample. And then sim actually simulates observations. So here we want to simulate observations because we want to give sample estimated values from the model for these different weights. So um, just made a data frame with the weights and got heights from the model using the sim function. Um, and then just use apply to get the mean of those and use the PI function to get the um, uh, percentile interval for, for each of them and put it all together in a, in a tibble. This is, this is where I really 
this package is not tidyverse friendly and it gets even worse in the next problem but um yeah this this mean pi is actually uh, a matrix you should be able to see probably over here somewhere and so to put that into a data frame you have to um, pull out the individual columns and then print it out so here's the results that i got of the mean low and high estimate of the weight for those uh, five individuals and of course i like to make a plot of everything so there's a plot showing again the mean and the uh the 89 percent range of each one okay so far yeah i think that's very clean coding so then the, nice. the, the second problem is to basically do the same thing for ages less than eight so I just pull out another uh, data frame with ages less than eight and repeat the same model with uh, the new data. Uh, your data is D3 and I'm subtracting the mean of D3 and looking at that. Um, and he asks how, how to interpret it. So it's just the standard interpretation of a linear model that the mean weight of 45, which is um, where the, this second parameter is zero then the A parameter covers so that the mean weight, the expected height is 108.2. The uh, percent interval of that is 107 to 109. B is the uh, expected change in height for every change in weight of one kilogram. The question asks for a change of 10 kilograms. So it's just 10 times that. And the range is 26 to 28 uh, centimeters. So basically, Somebody with the average weight will be 108 centimeters tall. And then for every 10 kilograms change in weight, there'll be 27 centimeter change in height. Um, so now for plotting, this is where I'm just, this is way too much code to do this. Um, again, I want to use ggplot for the plot, which means I want a data frame that has five different values. It has, for, um, well, six, I guess. It has the weight sequence for the X, and then for each weight sequence, I want a mean height, the proportional interval for the mean, and then the proportional interval for the estimated height. And so I just compute them all separately and jam them all into a data frame. So for the, um, starting with just a table with the weight, then use the link function to generate uh, values, sample values for the mean, and then take the mean of that. So this is giving me for each uh, for each weight, the, the expected value of the of the mean height, then the proportional interval of that is pi. Again, that gives a data frame or a matrix rather. So I just pull out the two columns of the matrix and stick those as mu low and mu high in the data frame. Uh, then simulate the height. So here I use um, length, and then here I use sim, and uh, Again, pulling out the PIs and sticking those, those low and high values into the data frame. And finally, I can do pretty straightforward plot of the data itself, a geom point, the, uh, the mean line, and then using a ribbon for the range of mu and the range of height. And the range of mu is pretty narrow. So I don't know if you can really see it in here. It's a very narrow gray band around the dark line. And then the uh, the lighter gray band that you can see is the uh, range of the expected values for height. So I don't know. I asked on the on Slack if anybody had a better way to do this. I'm I would I kind of think that I mean just from the name that Tidy Bays should have a way to do this a little cleaner and get it into a single data frame. But I looked at just looking at the data a bit and. Um, poking around, I, I didn't have time to figure that out. Um, so stop and see if anybody has any comments on a different way to construct this, uh, this final data frame so I can plot it. So I actually, I did a, the more the tidyverse way. So if we have time, I can go over that if anybody wants to see it. But the ggplot, I did, did use ggplot and some of the BRM and posterior functions to create the plot. But um, yeah, I got a, I had a very similar looking plot to yours in terms of 
straight line doesn't look so great. <laughs> so. Yeah. So that's the, the last part is, what do you think of that? And it's clearly not a linear relationship or overestimating height at the low and high end and probably underestimating it a little bit in the little in the, in the middle. So probably a nonlinear model would look better. Um, I don't know, should I go through H3, which is pretty similar? And then Laura, you could show how you did it in a tidyverse way. Is that sound good? Sounds good to me. Um, so now I'm just, the, uh, the question says, it's, it's a little bit long-winded, but it basically says um, you, you should be modeling the logarithm of bottom body weight, not weight. So I just um, made a new model that uses log of weight. Now I'm not um, subtracting out the mean because uh, that is different, gives you different, I don't know, it didn't seem appropriate with log. But other than that, I think this is the same model with um, the log normal for B and then the, and then just a normal for, for A, but uh, fitting the log and this is really hard to interpret. <laughs> you know, looking at these numbers, the A value, the mean A value is the predicted height for a, a weight that has a log of one. So that'd be our log of zero rather because this log weight term needs to be zero to have a prediction of A. So it's a prediction for somebody with a weight of one because log of, of one is zero and it's negative. So that doesn't, it's not really, very interpretable. And then B is a multiplicative change. That's a, a change in height for a change in the log weight of one. This is natural logarithm. So that means we're talking about changing the weight by a factor of about 2.72. So again, it's not really clear how that's helpful in terms of direct interpretation. Um, but the plot, I won't go through this code in detail because it's virtually identical to what I did for the previous problem, just computing mu with link and the um, PI values for mu, height with sim, the PI values for height, and then plotting it all. And clearly this is a much better fit to the data. It follows the curve uh, very nicely. The, um, you, can, you really can't even see the 89% PI interval for the mean, it's so, it's so narrow. Uh, or actually, no, this was 97%, which is even, even a wider interval than 89. And the 97% interval for the um, predicted height just matches up pretty nicely with the actual heights, maybe a little bit funny here where it gets wider, but it seems to be a much better fit. Um, and any comments on that? So I'll go ahead and stop and, and Laura, look forward to seeing what you did. Sure, and I realized I, I did not plot. I didn't get, I guess I must have missed that. I didn't get to the plot in, th in the three questions. So I'll have to go back and do that on my own, but okay. So um, this is, if you've looked at the tidyverse guide, um, this is really similar to, I'm basically following the structure he set out for uh. doing this. Yeah. So what I'm doing here with this weight sequence, right? We got the weights and then kind of centering the weight. I assume that's what weight underscore C means because we can't do that in the BRM function. Basically um, is weight minus the mean. So we have this BRM function. This takes, and I just use this iteration, this warm up, all this stuff. I basically just went with what the author of the tidyverse guy suggested. Obviously, you could play around um, with some of this, and this will save as an just FYI as like an RDS um, file to whatever directory you specify. So it's kind of nice because if you if you estimate it, then you want to like maybe knit a document, you can maybe just read in the RDS file and uh, have that available to you instead of having to like wait while the minutes while it <laughs> computes. So the um, arguments here, we have the data D2 family Gaussian and then um, height is one plus weight C. 
And then we have our priors. Um, so notice we don't put A and B in here, but we're, we're gonna be kind of specifying some of that over here. So the prior, of course, being you recognize this normal distribution or log normal um, for the, beta, the B uh, parameter and then our uniform sigma. And this will be, as he says, it, it's rough. The uniform sigma is just like a huge range here. Possibly I could have made that a little smaller, but it all worked out. So I've got this and then you just use the predict function here, um, height model, and the new data, it's weight sequence. And then you can specify the default is that um, 90, 95 percentile interval. Well, he said 89 percentile. Now that's a big deal. You just go in and you can kind of change that. That's how I approached it. Data frame. Then you find the columns, the weight sequence. You can see what weight um, corresponds to what. So then five rows here. So and I did not compare those to Kent to yours to see if they're reasonably close. That yeah, seem, um, seems reasonable, I guess. I, I didn't give it a lot of, you know, gut check or anything, but. I'm a little confused where the linear model comes in. Um, I guess I can check, let's see, I got, for the 46, I got 156, 153, one step. So yeah, you did get the same. Yeah, it's that BRM, and it's, it's a, the QOP or whatever function, the BRM is kind of that tidy, well, it's a BRMS package, but kind of the, I guess, more compatible with the, the tidyverse. But yeah, it's, a, it's definitely some different syntax here, but and this is like the Monte Carlo um, Markov chain, but it's the same, you know, estimation going on. So somehow it knows to use the, the uh, B and Sigma that you designed yes. in your prior. As in the prior. The mm -hmm. And then here's where I state that, um, you know, linear model here and the one, I, I don't, I guess, I mean, I'm thinking about that. It's just like in the LM formula, right? You can just put like a one if, is that if, I guess you put a zero if you don't want an intercept. Yeah. So I guess one is a way of saying that, yes, I do want an intercept. And then you specify the the prior for the, and for the intercept here. That's my guess. Uh, the syntax isn't super intuitive to me. And I really, when I got into the log model for the, Later, I had to really kind of double check everything I was doing to kind of make sure that it made made sense. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm, I just don't see how the the a plus b times weight part of the model factors in here, but I guess it's just part of the syntax that I don't understand. Yeah, it's a little it's a little bit perhaps not not as intuitive. Yeah, I agree that the. Q op or whatever we're calling it, that seems to make a little more sense. And then you can obviously specify, you don't have to, you can center the weight within that formula, which makes it a little bit easier. How long did the BRM package take for a model like that? Oh man, to be honest, I went on about a 15 minute walk. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I may have tried it again. I think it was probably a, a few minutes maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not like, you know, not, two yeah. hours later, you come back and, you know, <laughs> sure. um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so now filtering out below 18 years of age, so 192 rows, I didn't check, I did check that not on the console, console but, <clears throat> excuse me, you can verify that for yourself. So fit a linear regression to these data using QOP or BRM. Um, so here I have uh, very, so yeah, this is my, um, the, the priors, right? One, I guess I said 122. I can't remember if I, maybe I just felt, what is the average height? No, I think that was four feet. 122 centimeters is four feet. And in my very unscientific way, I thought, I don't know, what's the average of a, between a baby and a 18 year old? I thought maybe four feet, which might be a little bit not at all reasonable. I kind of narrowed this up a little bit um, at the log normal, right? Because we're talking about kids. Well, yeah, we're talking about kids here. So we definitely don't want to have it be negative. So I guess if we had a senior citizen uh, subset, we could maybe make that a little bit more narrow. And then you get this um, fun little warning messages. 
but and I think that there's a 2.72, right? I think that was what Kent got as well, 108. Yeah. So even though we have probably had very different priors, I don't remember what Kent's were off the top of my head, but my guess is they were different. We come up to the same estimates. So yeah, 27. So they said, what does this mean? 27 unit increase in height is predicted for every 10 units of increase in weight, standardized weight. Um, it seems really high, three times the magnitude of adults, but I was like, well, maybe childhood growth spurts. i not a child de development person, so I really don't have any sense of if that's reasonable or not. Okay, so this is um, based on, let's see, what I was finding in the tidyverse guide. So I specified the props manually, put the weight, and then this is the mu under 18. So that's like that average predicted value for a, a given individual mu sub i. So you probably recognize that it's pretty much the same plot that uh, Kent just showed us um, and definitely is not a linear relationship there. Yeah, so I said the same thing as Kent did. There's probably a log scale or maybe a quadratic, but I think log is right. Okay. So we're given this new, is new pr model priors. So I did do this. Now, this is a little bit different approach. And I, I question whether I took the right approach here. And I think Kent alluded to doing the centering it and then using the log just seemed a little wonky. I did center it before. Maybe I shouldn't have done that in hindsight. Um, I guess I could try, go back and see. So this is some wonky syntax here. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. I do think the QA, <laughs> it's worked. I got some warning messages. Um, but you have this BF like, selector thing in here. Um, and you have height and EXP. LB. So then I was going down to our priors, right? Um, I don't even know what this stands for. And I honestly, I was kind of going fast and I, I should have looked up all this stuff. But LB right here, of course, being our normal 0, 1. Um, and then you still the uniform prior. Um, you know, actually, I should have put log normal in there, I think. Although I already have a logarithm, so maybe not. <laughs> um, and 178.20, and then I just saved it as log model. So. What is LB in this model? So LB is like, it's the log, you're basically, it's, so I say it's that coefficient on the log of weight. So that's why this syntax is not as intuitive to me as what you were doing with the QA, the QAP or QAP formula. Um, and so I would I did it this way because I was trying to go through it doing a tidyverse way. But yeah. And so somehow this is actually using the putting the log of the weight mm -hmm. in the model. It is. It's transforming it. Yes. And okay. I need to I know no, I and I agree with you. It this looks pretty complicated, right? More so than what McElrith gives us in the book to me. Uh yeah, obviously or I might say obscure. Yes, obscure. Yeah. There's a lot to like, I was typing this out, even as I was changing stuff from what I, I saw the syntax. And it's like, there is like a lot to keep track of in this function. Um, I mean, a lot of this stuff is just, you know, not too hard. So then I'm, I got this down here. Um, and I have, I don't remember if this corresponds to, I, let's see, where did I get? Yeah, I guess that was as far as I got posterior summary. So yeah, it's, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. My but, A was was negative thirty and B was. And that 50. might have. This may not have transformed it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. and I think um, that might some of that might be have to do with log transformations. And to be honest, I haven't gone in and looked at that. Um, but yeah, this was just. I do believe the syntax is correct based on the information I'm given. I might go around and play with that, but yeah, 
So decide if you want to do that, if you're doing this kind of stuff, um, if you prefer to use the VRM function or maybe the QA AP, uh, Q, 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 QUAP function might be a little simpler um, if you can handle not doing it the tidyverse way. So any comments, uh, questions, corrections, somebody else try it with this way and do it differently? Yeah, I'd be curious if you did the plot for the log model as a way to Yeah, to I got to go. It. I'm going to go in and, and do that and see what if I get something similar to yours, then I'll be confident that it was probably um, probably accurate. But uh, yeah, I didn't get that far. So well, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah, you maybe don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Wait. if you've got a, a, a log transformation, to, uh, stick with a Q, QUAP quad or whatever we're calling it, that function. So, yeah. You could always just log it before you like. Yeah, I thought about doing that. I wasn't sure. And I, that's a good idea. Yeah. I, I did think about doing that. What kind of hung me up was do I need to center it? I mean, he says to, I guess we don't really need to necessarily. I know Miguel Ruth recommends we, and the logging it whilst in the context of also centering it, that was where I was kind of unsure of uh, actually, how to gonna, handle that. It's going to break because when you center it, you'll get negative values. Yeah, so you can't center really... it. You have to just do it uh, normally. So yeah, maybe maybe I'll go back and just log. I think that might be, I think Elliot was the one who said that, that might be a better uh you know, better option to try, but, you know, and the weight center too is, that could also have to do with the different coefficients now that I'm thinking about it, Kent, because I have a different variable here, right? It's already, scale the same way, but, you know, it's, already, gonna, yeah, we're already kind already of operating, it's it. a different, it's a slightly different model, really. Right. Um, so I, it's pro that's probably my guess is what's going on here, but I think I like the interpretability of not centering it, especially when we're dealing with well, obviously logs, you can't really, um, or I guess if you centered, yeah. So uh, yeah, anyways, that's it. Yeah, I'm actually noticing Thank just you. how confusing that was because you're in the code, you're exponentiating the coefficient on the centered weight. Yeah, which, that kind of got me. I was like really trying to think through that. And I kind of laughed when he said a lot of social scientists have forgotten what they, know about logs, you know, because <laughs> it has been a while, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it, it wasn't as intuitive, really, as just saying, hey, we're logging the explanatory variables. So I don't know, I'm not sure the, the benefit of having that BRM function syntax be like that. Yeah, uh, one, one question, I, and that I have no idea what the answer is going to be, is like, <laughs> what exactly is the purpose? Like, what need is the BRM our BRMS package like fulfilling. So in my mind, like if people actually do Bayesian analyses, they use R JAGs or R STAN if they're using R. Mm -hmm. So like what what is BR? Like what is so like for example, McElrith's functions are like pedagogical functions for his book. So I understand what that's for. Mm -hmm. Like what BRMS is that just like to do Bayes in the tidyverse? I think so. And I think it is built on our stand somehow. But like I said, I, to be honest, I was not getting that guide, which is a very detailed um, guide for BRMS. I was not giving it the attention I ideally would have liked to because I was just trying to complete the problems and, uh, you know, try before our meeting today. So maybe I'll go take a look. And if I find anything, I'll post it in the Slack channel so you all can see it. Or obviously, if anybody else finds anything, feel free to post it. I kind of think it's a little higher level, maybe, that it sort of wraps up the model definitions, which is maybe why yeah. we didn't actually see the, um, the linear model explicitly in what Laura was showing. I'm not sure, but I think it's just a little bit more packaged up. Well, the Markov chain Monte Carlo, right? I don't think that's that might be a little bit more, and it kind of alludes to that we're going to be getting into that, but I don't think yeah. that's going under the hood with the... Well, that's using, it's definitely using Stan under the hood. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's our standard or what, well, I don't know directly, but um, 
I really don't know. That's my impression. So I was just going to say, my impression was that it was about the customizability of like how you specify the model. Like if you, you know, you have kind of like some collection of sort of like standard practices or something that gets you 90% of the way. But if you have like some, I don't know, non-normal model that you want to specify, I think they're easier or harder in the different implementations. That was my, my kind of uninformed uh, understanding. Like we were doing like very simple stuff right now, but like once mm -hmm. you get you know, I don't know, cutting edge of science or something where you're trying to like model some process that isn't like, you know, I don't know, you couldn't, it's not just like a line through two variables or something. Um, that's where I thought I came in. That's interesting. Yeah, I feel like I'm just trying to absorb the material. This was a really long chapter and it took me, and it was pretty in depth trying to get through it and then be like, okay, now apply this and also let's do it a tidy verse way. I have no idea how his course, they're covering like two to three chapters a week. I guess they don't have as many homework problems. That must be it. But I like doing a lot of the problems. I think it really helps to cement understanding of, you know, how you would implement this and practicality. But so. Yeah, I guess it's a university course. So maybe they don't have so much else going on. In their yeah, life, life isn't, uh, they don't have full-time jobs or whatever. Yeah. Right. So what's up for next week? Um, I guess we press on. Chapter five, and I think, is that the um, categories of spurious lecture? Yeah. Oh, in the title of the chapter. I don't, that's, that's two words I would not have put together, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, the mini variables and the spurious waffles. It's a good band name. Yeah, I guess it does have Seattle. I'm thinking Seattle Grunge, circa 1994 or something. Yeah. Huh. I'd, go more, waffles. I'd go more prog rock, I think. But, uh, I'm just thinking Sunday morning breakfast. <laughs> and there, there are no spurious waffles there. They're all eaten. <laughs> So just looking at the um, the um, lectures, has anybody gone ahead? The, I think, because it actually shows chapters four and five for week two and chapters five and six for week three. So I'm not sure which lectures actually correspond to chapter five. I wonder if anybody knows. I think on the YouTube, it is they have like one, about an hour of lecture for each chapter. And I have honestly not watched YouTube channel. I wish I had, but um, I have more read the books. I think he has it delineated on his YouTube channel, though, which lecture corresponds to which chapter. Not sure if that's what you're asking, Ken. Yeah. I think I know. lecture was for chapter four. At least a lot of it overlapped. I haven't watched the second video, which I'm guessing lines up to chapter five, but I think that they do kind of go along with the book from, from what I've seen. Yeah, they go along with it roughly. Like I haven't watched all of them, but I do know that some things are presented in different order. Like he, he presents them in a different order. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they're they're actually really good. They have a really high production value. So if anyone's like really yeah. bored and I would encourage you to watch I'm them. I'm enjoying them too. And they give a good overview. It makes the chapter, it makes it a lot easier to read the chapter. Mm -hmm. I find to have gotten the introduction beforehand. That's that's a good thought, because sometimes I, I wonder if maybe I should watch the lecture before reading the chapter, if it would just come a little more smoothly, you know, than trying to be like, okay, yeah. which coat, what, what, what object were we talking about? And like, okay, how does this all translate from theory to, you know, it Makes practice. it easier to skim the chapter a little bit too, because mm -hmm. you already <laughs> hit the high points. And it's like, okay, I don't think I need this. It wasn't in the lectures. Or I got this from the lecture. I don't need to read all the details. And that's what I did this week too. Yeah, I tried that too. video and then reading and uh, <laughs> only downside I didn't get that far into the homework, but it was much more yeah. absorbable mentally to do the reading after. He talks a lot about flow too and, and just watching the videos helps me move forward at all because I feel like if I only had the book I would get stuck and <laughs> I don't understand this and then and not keep moving forward. So that's it's been good for me.
Okay, chapter five, spurious waffles. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to finding out what those are. We're gonna have waffles next week while we do the book. Oh, <laughs> mm. I don't know. I Cooking watches. Well, I will say it is almost gal. It will be almost Valentine's Day for those of us who are Parks and Recs fan, and you know what Leslie Note says about waffles. So for those of you who I'm actually not a Parks sure. and Recs okay. watcher, so I guess maybe maybe just me. Joke. Okay, no, you get the joke. You. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> right, well, I'll say, I'll post a picture. We always have waffles waffles one morning on the weekend, and I'll I'll post a picture. Perfect. Those can be our class waffles, our club <laughs> waffles. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll pick up like some egos for class. Um, egos. Okay. Those yes, are spurious perfect. waffles yeah. for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess uh, we've had. I, well, first of all, thank you both to Laura and Kent for being the superstars of today's class. Thank you. And uh, you're welcome. Sure thing. It's good for me to go through the problems. So I learned a lot. And uh, hopefully I'll knit up some spurious waffles for next week's presentations. Anyway, I guess that's it. All right. See you next week. Bye. See ya. Bye.